anyway, we were, uh, you know, Ian Halperin, here's Whispers, and then uh, Richard Lee, the funeral home. Yeah, I mean, we we ended up meeting Tom Grant, right? That's where it sort of started getting serious. And and you go to Tom Grant, or Tom Grant comes to you, or we travel we travel to Los Angeles. We heard that. Uh, so he's know, still in Beverly Hills at that time. Still in or, Beverly Hills, yeah. Okay, his office, yeah. What a nice place to be a private investigator. Well, I think that's why uh, Courtney called him. <laughs> Right, right. He, he right. says that too, right? It gave him this credibility. She Easter Sunday, she was looking through the yellow pages. She saw Beverly Hills and just, you know, she probably regrets that decision. Assume this is the kind of private investigator who will do whatever I want them to do because I'm a celebrity. So what was your first impression when you meet uh, P.I. Grant at the time? You sit down, you talk to him and first impression of him? I think we spent a lot of time sizing up Tom to see whether we could take him seriously in his claims, right? Like the the, the whole case was going to live or die on Tom Grant's credibility. And, you know, he came off as this very straight-laced guy. Um, I don't want to put down private investigators, but a lot of them are known for kind of working on the fringes of the law, you know, stretching. Well, truth. that's what impressed. Yeah. That's exactly true. And that's what impressed us about about Tom. He was, you know, definitely what? straight laced, but he had so much integrity, you could tell. And we investigated him mm -hmm. big time. We spent a lot of time trying to get the dirt on Tom, right? What what what's he hiding? The internet was only in its infancy at that time. So it was harder to do. But we discovered nothing but good things. And in the time we spent with him, you know, he's getting calls all the time. You know, I want you to put a bug in my husband's car or whatever. And he just refused to do anything illegal. And you could tell it wasn't like he was putting on a show for us. Right. This this is a guy with a lot of integrity, so much integrity that, you know, to this day, I, I'm still very fond of Tom, despite the fact that he stands for almost everything I'm against uh, politically. And, you know, we clash all the time politically, and yet I'm still very fond of him. And, I, and he gives a lot of credibility to this case. That's one thing I love about Tom Grant is you can disagree on all kinds of things and still be friendly with him. You know what I mean? A lot of people aren't like that. If you don't believe what they believe, you're on the other team, you know, and, and you're my enemy. But right. uh, yeah, so you, you, you want to find dirt on him because you don't, the last thing you want to do is back up this story and then find out that you know he was involved in some other mess in the past but you don't find anything or that he's trying to you know i think a lot of people in the music industry assumed from his background and his you know conservative he he's everything that courtney and kurt are not right he's the, right like the person you would never expect to to be in that in that scene and you know again that gives him a lot of credibility right because he's not this sleaze bag that you that you expect and that we encountered right we ended up encountering courtney's private investigator and having run-ins and he tried to blackmail us and he tried to bribe us later on and he tried to stop our book from coming out this, jack, this, jack, jack Paladino, Paladino, right he's a very famous private investigator but he's also like the type of person you would you would expect to be associated with somebody like courtney love right tom grant not so much was he was he a scary character too no he was kind of a charming character right he used oh his, uh, okay you know we we could get into that right but that's like that's a, uh, actually that's not that much further we we end up going on a um on a speaking tour with hank harrison another one of the motley cast of characters we end up encountering during this very colorful right? cast of characters yeah so all of a sudden we're hanging around with hey man i i, I loved hank like in his own way i loved him that dude was amazing not only that <laughs> but but a, a little story that i've never told he and my mother actually started to bond right and <laughs> yeah they're all friendly and, and it was such an unlikely pairing right and, you know i mean he, he's kind of a shady character i i have to say right but i also enjoy yeah that's part of his charm and, though yeah and you know he he had he was the first manager of the grateful dead before they were the grateful dead when yeah the war yeah he yeah. he's you know we go over to his his house or his apartment and 
He's got letters from Charles Manson to the dead. He's got all this like <laughs> Grateful Dead uh, memorabilia. Charles Manson had a swastika on, on the envelope he sent him. Um, from from Folsom, uh, Folsom Prison. No, this is before oh, 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 duh. Heard of Charlie Manson, but duh, Charlie Manson, right. you know, in San Francisco was because he's trying um, to ingratiate himself in the music community, in the music scene. And so he's got all these stories and they're authentic. Right. And so it was just fascinating hanging out with him. And then we finally get to talking about Courtney Love. Right. And, you know, there's still a lot of people, even people deeply immersed in this case that have a, a sort of uh uh, contempt for Hank for you know even if you believe your daughter is capable of this you shouldn't be airing that dirty on laundry in public and I think Ian and I had that that feeling right this was a little unseemly we we're a little suspicious of him but then he starts you know it was really valuable hanging out with 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 Hank because Hank it turns out you know Courtney almost claims that she never knew him right that's a yeah. lot that's one yeah. of her many lies right but like he's got a trove of letters and artwork and poems from courtney and it's clear that she spent a lot of time with him when she was a teenager you know he sort of like bailed her out and and um they spent a lot of time traveling together and they were very close at one point yeah. and then so you came into some money when you were a kid were you you were living over here when you were 14 without your 14, parents 14 yeah I, I i i blagged my way to uh my trust fund that i'd gotten into trinity college in dublin and which was a complete and utter lie what courtney does not say is at the time she was actually living in ireland with hank harrison he told me a little bit about that time now, Courtney wants control of her trust fund. As long as she is underage and she's under the guardianship of a parent, they control it and she can only get so much a month. But if she goes to university, then she's considered an independent. She's considered an adult and she has direct access to her trust fund. Courtney actually got a hold of letterhead from Trinity College, typed out an acceptance letter, sent it to the financial institution that controlled her trust fund, explaining she needs more money each month for for books and tuition and to live because you can't work a full-time job while you're going to school full-time, right? She commits felony fraud and it should tell you that Courtney has no problem forging letters to people. My real father told me that somehow he was somehow a professor there or something, but he was like a pot dealer there <laughs> <laughs> or a hash dealer there. Yeah. We have Courtney in one interview telling us that it was all a lie just to gain money from her trust fund. She talks about how her father had lied to her, said he was a professor at this college. Turned out he was just a drug dealer. Seems to me that pathological lying runs in the family. But but again, you, you can't really believe anything Hank says about about Courtney and you can't believe anything she says about him. But these letters and these poems uh, were invaluable, right? You know, if Hank says that Courtney's a sociopath, <clears throat> you just dismiss that. But when you see the evidence in these letters, then you sit up and take notice, right? The um, the poems, that, what, one thing that really bothers me about this whole case, even people that I really admire and respect that, you know, these amateur detectives, people that are watching right now and you know, <laughs> they, they, they follow your, your show, they're obsessed with this case, but they're also obsessed with Courtney, right? They hate her so much, right? Maybe, mm -hmm. you know, maybe it's understandable. They think she killed their their um their hero right so i understand hey, hey, can, can i speak on this real quick sure for you okay because when i first started writing videos about this i didn't hate courtney love but i definitely disliked her the more i got to know about courtney love and and the more things dirty things i found out she did to people and got away with yeah. over and over yes there is a disdain for courtney love because you know people want justice they right. want they want things to be fair and even and you see this woman uh because she's rich and she has connections she's throwing rocks through people's windows she's trying to catch someone on fire she's beating people up and never never being punished no that's, i i understand the disdain i understand the hatred for her but the problem with that 
with a lot of these the, the people that follow this case is it blinds them to the reality. Okay, they okay. can't understand how could Rolling Stone put Courtney Love on the top two hundred singers of all time? How could these people defend Courtney Love? She must be buying them off. That's preposterous nonsense, right? When you when you are immersed in this community of musicians and music journalists and people like that, you realize that they all believe the same thing about Courtney Love. They think she's crazy they think she's a sociopath they know she lies they know she's a junkie and yet they have immense respect for her as a musician is it respect or is it drama it's absolutely respect and again like as somebody old enough to have remembered this era and have spoken to so many fans right and realized that that people still to this day believe that live through this was a seminal album an incredibly mm-hmm. important album. And so getting back to Hank Harrison. So we're going through her her letters and her artifacts and artwork and a lot of poems, you know, that she wrote when she was 15, 16 years old. And you realize she's an immensely talented uh, poet. And that's all she's ever claimed. People say, oh, well, Kurt, Kurt wrote, lived through this. Yes, he probably did contribute the musical bridges, but... There's I don't believe that, that Kurt wrote the lyrics. I think Cor- no. I think Courtney's way too arrogant to put somebody else's lyrics on her right. album. She wrote the lyrics. Absolutely. And she assembled the band. She assembled, you know, she she recruited or, you know, Eric was obviously instrumental. In who, the who, by the well. way, a lot of people don't know Eric was already in the corporate world. He worked for Capitol Records before he even started right. Hole. He's a very smart guy, right? Like yeah, you know, he was a yeah. and r rep, I think. And, and, you know, Kristen Pfaff ends up in Courtney's band. But but Courtney, you know, be, long before that, Courtney was in that Riot Girl scene. She was very well respected by a lot of people in that scene. There is no movement. There isn't. It's a, it's a press myth. No, no, no. Honestly, there's, there's like... Um, some, you know, there's like the same kind of feminism there's always been. There's, um, you know, in LA, there's girls that, that get together that talk, you know, have group meetings like there's been since the 60s and 50s and, you know, 70s and 80s. Um, and there's like 10 people that, you know, call themselves riot girls and it, it's just the press. It's a total press invention. Okay, so this was sort of my first hint that Although Max is very knowledgeable about this case, clearly he wrote two books about it and sold probably hundreds of thousands or millions of copies. And I'm not trying to make him look bad, but there were some things that maybe he's not as knowledgeable about as we are. Um, Toby Vale, you know, Kathleen Hanna, that whole riot girl scene from Olympia. Courtney was not respected there. They actually hated her. There was a lot of jealousy over Kurt. You know, those girls... Uh, were friends with Kurt and Toby dated Kurt right before Courtney moved in and then Courtney would go on to denounce their scene and say it was a press myth so maybe somewhere along the way Max got some facts mixed up I think what happened is he's thinking of Portland he's mixing up Olympia in Portland because Courtney did have friends in Portland and there are people that say they knew her before she was ever famous and they knew she was going to be famous I think he he's just mixing up these two scenes but that's okay because he's an investigative journalist about the Cobain case and the reason for talking to him is not for necessarily the underground music history, but for the characters he would come to meet and interrogate. She was a very good actor already. You know, she was in Sid and Nancy and she w- she had a reputation in Portland as, as kind of a crackpot and people, you know, stayed away with her. We were the first ones to ever, I think, Uh, interview her ex-husband who told us that she used to pay people to beat up her enemies right so you know there's some not evidence but there's some uh fuel for the fire uh uh, james james moreland was that his name yeah that that sounds right it's been so long um so you know but we spent a lot of time talking to people who knew her in portland who knew her before she was famous and 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 you get insights about her yes she's a sociopath but she's also very talented and so if you dismiss that and just say oh no she killed kurt and kurt wrote live through this that's all very well anybody could believe that but then they don't understand it's really important to understand how immensely respected she is in the music scene and in that in that 
whole music world um, and among fans, even even Nirvana fans that don't buy the conspiracy theories, right? A lot of them who loved Nirvana also loved Live Through This. Mm -hmm. A lot of young women at that time, right? Like teenage girls who, you know, Courtney spoke to them, right? Courtney's anger, Courtney's crazy persona really spoke to them and really had an impact, just like Kurt had an impact on a whole generation of young people. And unless you understand that, you don't really understand what's going on there. You know, it's preposterous, the idea that, oh, she's buying these people off. Now she's incredibly powerful and rich. So that obviously has its own uh, advantages for her. Right. right. It's right. probably kept her out of prison and a lot of not not necessarily for murder, but a whole bunch of other things. Right. All the all the drug stuff that she's admitted to. Um, so, yes. And, and assaults. But, you know, and she's also... I mean, we could talk about, I, you know, we encounter a lot of these people that people just talk, talk and speculate about uh, on the internet now around this case, right? We spend time with Dylan Carlson. We spend time in that scene. And, you know, I, I, I have a lot of insight into what's going on now with, with members of her old bands, right? And where they are and how a lot of them are very dependent. Dylan Carlson, dependent on Courtney's money. Uh uh, Patty Schemmel, dependent on Courtney's money. A whole bunch of people were dependent on Courtney's money. That doesn't mean and, she's buying them and, off necessarily with, with you know, to, and buying their silence, right? Like those are two different things, but you have to spend time in that in that world before you start to understand that, right? I understand why people, you know, are quick to jump to these conclusions and it, it's more complicated than that, right? So in, in unraveling all this, inc this incredibly complex case, you have to really, re you know, understand that stuff. So you don't just dismiss, oh, how could she be on, on the, she must have bought her way onto the Rolling Stones list. No, she's really well respected. And that album is still considered one of the great, you know, punk albums of all time. It's a fact. Okay, so let me go ahead and interrupt there. Obviously, this part of the interview confused me as it may confuse you. It's like, what's going on here? And I allowed Wallace to say, speak his mind. I did not edit this out of the video. You know, I, I didn't want to be disrespectful. There were things that I wanted to say, I'm going to say right now, but I didn't want to piss off my uh, guest and then have him say, well, now I'm upset and I don't want to talk to you. I understand what he's saying. He's saying there's a ton of people online who just don't like Courtney. They dismiss her. And because of that, they think she had something to do with Kurt's death. And he's also saying you can't do that. You have to respect her. You have to know that she's talented. In order to know the case, you have to respect Courtney for all of her talent. Okay. I don't get that because objective facts have nothing to do with whether you like Courtney Love or not. Are there people in the world who constantly bicker about Courtney who know absolutely nothing about the Cobain case? Sure. And there are people online who do this. I hate Courtney, therefore she must have done something to Kurt. I'm not one of those people. I've laid out all the objective facts within the Nirvana series. So I was kind of unsure why he was sort of um, lecturing me about those kind of people when my channel is not that kind of group. Just because I also point out all these terrible things about Courtney Love does not change the objective facts. So you can love her, you can hate her, and those objective facts are still gonna be there. They're still gonna be the same. The reason why I so often talk about all the terrible, and it, it's very clear that Max does not know Courtney Love's entire history. Right when I think that I know everything, I learned something else. Just the other day, I learned that Calvin Johnson, the owner of K Records, the, the guy that Kurt would hang out with in Olympia, he had a restraining order against Courtney for assault and harassment. Guess what? She never went to jail. She was never charged with anything. Somehow there's a restraining order, but no criminal charge. Let's read part of it, see what happened. He talks about how she called late at night, left a threatening message on his phone, and then uh, the next day proceeded to track him down. She sought me out in a public place, the OZ nightclub, 131, Seattle, blah, 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 verbally abused me in front of over a dozen people and punched me in the face three times. 
Courtney's problem is she's never punched anyone that would punch her back. It doesn't matter whether it's male or female. If someone attacks you in public, you have the right to defend yourself. That's every state in the United States. I wish she would punch me in the face. Over a dozen people witnessed this. Absolutely no consequence, except for a stupid piece of paper that says stay away from this guy. The reason why I spend so much time on Courtney Love's past and all these things that maybe her fans would say are just being mean is to establish a pattern of behavior. I'm trying to point out what kind of person we're dealing with here. And the way to do that is to look at someone's behavior. If all these things happen in her young life and then, you know, 20 years has gone by and she's been in no trouble, then I'd say, okay, she grew up, she matured, she changed, but she's still getting into shit to this day. A pattern of behavior. We have laws for these kinds of things. Every state in the United States has laws for repeat offenders. It's what we call recidivists. If you are a first time offender, you've never been in trouble before. There is actually a book, Morals and Ethics, of law that every judge and prosecutor is supposed to read. Now, they don't have to abide by it, but morally, ethically, they are supposed to. And that says if it's a first-time offender who's never been in trouble before, they should have the very bare minimum sentence, unless there are extenuating circumstances, like a very, very violent crime or very horrific crime, crimes against the elderly, crimes against children, which at one point, Courtney should have had child abuse. Remember the story I told about her dragging an 11, 12-year-old Francis out at night so she could break into her boyfriend's who had broken up with her, her ex-boyfriend's house. Seems like child neglect to me. And oh, by the way, that story came directly from the mouth of Francis Bean. So yeah, it kind of offends me a little bit when someone's like, you just don't like Courtney, so you make things up. No, these aren't made up things. This isn't rumor and hearsay and all, all the other words that her fans like to throw around. These are things that I found in court documents. My whole point is this. Just like there are people who disdain Courtney and know nothing about the Cobain case, so they automatically jump to, oh, she must have done it. There are also people who love Courtney who dismiss people like me and channels like mine. Oh, well, he just doesn't like Courtney, so he's saying all these terrible things about her. It goes both ways. There's a lot of people out there that I believe if they knew the extent of her history, how many people she has hurt in her life, they would have a different opinion of her. So back to what I was saying about recidivists and a pattern of bad behavior. If they are a repeat offender, the, the sentences get harsher and harsher. California has the three strikes you're out laws, right? As far as I know, unless they've changed that, it is very important to establish a pattern of behavior. And that's what I've done on my channel. It's not only representing the, the objective facts, it's also saying this person has been hurting people her entire life. Oh, and by the way, she also used people to create great albums. This, this isn't even like something that should be argued. There's proof, like this clip from a sound engineer who Courtney failed to pay, as she is known to do at smaller clubs, who uploaded her tracks and her tracks alone so people could see what she really sounds like. <laughs> I want to start it. In demonology. I'm not coming down on uh, Mr. Wallace. I actually quite like the guy. I enjoyed the conversations I had with him, but I just didn't understand the point he was trying to make here. Uh, maybe I took it the wrong way. I don't know. He also told me later that he knows people who know the members of Hole. Maybe he just doesn't want to ruffle any feathers and um, burn any bridges. We talked about Live Through This being a seminal record. I do agree that they are Courtney's lyrics. I've always said that. I know a lot of my audience disagrees with me. They think Kurt wrote the lyrics. I don't. I think Courtney's way too arrogant to allow anybody to put their words on it. I believe she wrote the songs, but I believe Kurt and Kristen, and this was actually, this has been proven. I can't even believe I'm having to go over this. A big part of the reason why Kristen and Courtney had a falling out is dirty, during the recording sessions in Atlanta, and this has been discussed by the producer, Kristen was telling Courtney how to arrange the music and how to arrange the lyrics. Okay, Courtney was like, no, I want to do it this way. Kristen said, well, it's going to sound better this way. 
the producer was agreeing with Kristen. And therefore, the songs ended up being the way Kristen and the producer wanted them. And Courtney hated Kristen for it. She resented her. This was my album. And you came in and you won over the producer and he did what you wanted to do. Maybe Max doesn't know all that. I don't know. This isn't rumor. It isn't hearsay. It isn't amateur internet sleuths. Um, this comes from the producer of the album. It comes from Billy Corgan. It, it came from other people who were friends with Kristen, people who would know. He argues that Live Through This is a seminal album. Well, Kurt Cobain did backup vocals on Live Through This. That's a fact. By the way, Kristen Pfaff wrote Miss World. That was supposed to be a Janitor Joe song. That was one of their hits on that album. A song that Courtney and Eric would take credit for. Kristen Pfaff did backup vocals on Celebrity Skin. Melissa Oftemeyer just recently uh, did an interview where she said there are as many as seven tracks backing Courtney on every song of her voice. She said, I'm the one who made Courtney sound good. With each album, Courtney had help. Later, when Courtney had alienated everybody around her for taking credit for everything they did, and she put out a solo album, people got to see how terrible she really was on her own. So I just don't understand people that lift her up and say she's the most talented woman in rock. I would look to Kathleen Hanna, Toby Vale, Kristen Pfaff, Mia Zapata, Alanis Morissette, Dolores O'Riordan, Fiona Apple, PJ Harvey, the girls from The Breeders, Kim Deal from The Pixies, Kim Gordon from Sonic Youth, Shall I Go On, so many other women who actually made their own music and didn't need the people around them to do it for them. Anyone remember a metal band called Kitty? That was an all-girl group. I put them up there with Pantera and Acid Bath. Like, there are tons of great women in Alternative who really did write their own songs and create their own music. Courtney did not. Everybody around her did it for her. Only thing she did was pen the words. What did Kurt Cobain do? What was the last thing Kurt Cobain would do? Pen the words. You know why? Because the words are the least important. A good song, if sung correctly, it doesn't matter what the words are, it's going to sound awesome. That's a fact. Whether you love Courtney Love or not, she had tons and tons of help from very, very talented people. Two of those people ended up dead within two months, and she and Eric Erlinson were the last people to have contact with them. I, I've watched this three or four times now, and I still, I don't know, maybe, maybe he just couldn't explain himself very well. I still don't understand how objective facts can be changed by what you think of Courtney. There, there are two different things. Well, Melissa Optimeyer, like I told you, she did a recent interview, and I think this is why specifically Courtney being called uh, one of the 200 best singers, Melissa Oftemeyer said, I'm the one who made Courtney sound good. There, uh, Every track on, on Celebrity Skin has my backup vocals three to seven times layered over right. Courtney. You know? and, yet, and yet nobody talks about Celebrity Skin as a se seminal album. It's all about live through this. Billy right? Corgan does. He you, talks you, about it a lot. But... Right. Well, that's <laughs> like he, he was instrumental in that. If you say yeah. that Kurt, Kurt wrote the musical bridges for uh, for Live Through This, Billy Corgan, by his own admission, wrote a lot of Celebrity Skin. But Celebrity Skin is not really talked about anymore, right? It's If, if anybody deserves the credit for that sound it's Kristen Pfaff right so Kristen Pfaff was an incredible bassist who helped create that sound do you see why I got confused a little bit of contradiction here like I just don't think Max knows the backstory to the recording sessions I think if he knew the backstory to the Atlanta recording sessions he would be saying yeah okay it was Kurt and Kristen. And you know what? Courtney may have been a little jealous because, you know, people people say, of course, I never saw Kristen Pfaff in real life, but people say she was beautiful. She was fucking Cleopatra. Like people were just mesmerized by her dark eyes and jet black hair. Maybe the producer sort of took to Kristen's side because of that. I, I don't know. But uh, Kristen and Kurt definitely had their way with Live Through This. Maybe he doesn't know that whole story. And again, you have to understand that and realize that that's the way it's perceived by 90% of the of that world, right? That that Courtney is a very important person in her own right, outside yeah. of her sphere. Right, and once right. And you understand that, then 
you know, feel you can take a more, take a more objective her or hate her, believe that she murdered her husband, right? All that stuff is plausible, but it still doesn't take away from the genuine respect that she has, right? So, I mean, you know, the members of Nirvana certainly aren't bought off by her. They 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 can't stand Courtney. Um, but- well, she did she did sue them for the right for complete rights to Nirvana, which I thought was kind of unfair on her part, but. You know, I understand. Yeah, I mean, there's wrote... been all kinds of business, you know, conflicts yeah. for the years, yeah. right? But they never liked Courtney. Dave used to dismiss her as Yoko, uh, and yet Dave and Chris clearly do not believe the conspiracy theories. They're absolutely 100 percent convinced to this very day that Kirk killed himself. This is another part where maybe Max doesn't know the whole backstory. Dave and Courtney were friends before Courtney ever met Kurt Cobain. Dave is the one who took the heart-shaped box full of seashells to Kurt. Okay, we talked about that in a video. Courtney got to Kurt through Dave. She basically faked a friendship with Dave, and who knows, Dave may have, in the beginning, He Dave was a, a ladies' man in the beginning. He loved groupies. Maybe he was trying to get with Courtney. But when it became very apparent, Courtney was after Kurt, Dave backed off. Who's at the wedding? Standing in between Kurt and Courtney. Dave Grohl. Dave Grohl had a good relationship with Courtney until Kurt died and Courtney started trying to take over the 100% rights of Nirvana. That's what caused the rift. Now, it is true, Chris Novoselic and Shelly never cared for Courtney. He said she's some obnoxious girl. I've never heard of her before. Don't want to know her. Dave knew Courtney before Kurt even knew Courtney. Dave helped Courtney ingratiate herself with Kurt, and that's how their relationship truly began, was through her friendship with Dave Grohl. Pat Smear, that's a whole other issue, but he didn't. I've never heard Pat comment on it. Uh, Chris has outright said he shouldn't have done it. Now, as for Dave, I've never heard Dave. Dave always kind of skips around the subject. That might be because he doesn't want to, you know, pee Courtney off, but he's always like, when Kurt died or after Kurt died, he never says, you know what I'm Dave, saying? Dave's not dependent on Courtney. Dave, Dave, Dave is very right. More than Courtney, but I think he, he, he doesn't like, he said he was afraid to write about Kurt in the book right. in the book he wrote. He just doesn't want any lawsuits or any kind of drama with Courtney. So he dances around the subject. Yeah. And, that, and yet I know a lot of people that know Dave and there's not a single person that I know who knows Dave in, in that, that world that, that says that Dave believes Kurt was murdered. Dave does really? not. Really? Kurt was okay. murdered. So that's, con- that's confirmed. Is. Okay. Like I've, always, I've always wondered. I've always wondered, yeah. last interruption, this has become very apparent that I am not a good interviewer because what I was talking about was totally different than the response I got. I'm talking about Dave just trying to keep the peace with Courtney, and Max responds with, Dave's not afraid of Courtney. Dave's not dependent upon Courtney. Well, clearly, I mean, the Foo Fighters pack stadiums. He, he's a billionaire. Why, why would he be dependent on Courtney? I just feel like at some points throughout this discussion, um, him and I are talking about two different things. But from here on out, it gets really good. And we and we start to focus and really talk about the people, the players in his book, and less about unnecessary little things. You know, because he's never Chris really has said. become a Chris is a bit of a crackpot today, unfortunately, right? He's always had serious issues. He was always Political. an alcoholic. Like he always had he always had serious mental health issues. It's hard to take Chris very seriously. At one point, he was a very progressive and and important um, player in progressive politics, right? On that, that that ship has passed. But Dave certainly is an incredibly respected and powerful figure, right? He's not afraid of Courtney. He's not worried about pissing off Courtney. He doesn't need Courtney. He's they they still make a lot of money from Nirvana. Um no matter no matter what she's done, right? Like she Yeah. I, I food, food fighters Courtney. sells out stadiums to this day. You right. know I paid five hundred bucks to just yeah. to watch them be uh, inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame from a nosebleed seat, you know? Right. <laughs> you said that uh, you wrote the chapter about loss and about Kurt last. Why? Because I was scared to write it. I mean, you know, it's one thing to write about getting stitches when you're 12 years old, or it's one thing to write about, you know, taking your kids to the daddy-daughter dance. It's another thing to write about something that you've barely spoken about with 
uh, with people close to you. I mean, I revealed some things in that story that I've never told my closest friends. Um, I was scared to write it. I mean, you know, first of all, I knew what people wanted me to write. I think that people um, have a lot of unanswered questions, as do I. You came out uh, recently and said, there are no more lost, unreleased Nirvana tracks. They're, they're all out there. But you did say there's a whack of video footage that's, that's not been put together. So there are no more unfinished tracks or unreleased tracks, but there's a ton of video. There's a ton of video. You said it. We're going to reissue Nevermind on vinyl, 180 gram vinyl. Courtney's going to allow that? Um, yeah, we're going to allow it. <laughs> <laughs>